What's up everybody? It's Justin. Welcome to live. Ask me anything number 80. 80 weeks of AMAs. It's actually a lot more than that. As you know, because a couple have gotten skipped along the way. But 80 weeks is a long time. Boom, there's Judy. What's up? She's here every single time. Love it. Making sure that everything's posted to Instagram right now. Telling people to come join us with the swipe up feature. Hopefully that works. Hopefully they get some more people in the room. The more live viewers, the better. Particularly on nights like tonight when I do not have a planned presentation for you. Now I'm going to put this in, make sure that posted, and I'm going to put this in airplane mode. Um, but this is going to be a standard AMA, like a true AMA, which means I want to answer a lot of your questions here live as well. So I want to make sure that we have questions coming in, in the comment thread. If you have questions, ask them, click the like button, click the love button, click the happy button, click the wow button, all the emojis and all the things. The more engagement we can get going, the more people will see this in their feed and the more people will join us to ask us questions. Ask me anything. Also, you can click the share button, click the share button and share this to your timeline. If you think there are some people that need to learn about nutrition, health, wellness, all things, Clovis, all the super important stuff. Okay, so this video is up, let me see. There it is, me, again, two of me. Whoa, weird, okay, good to go. So that means I can now put this into airplane mode and not worry about the phone right now. That's weird, right? We're gonna not worry about phones at some point in 2019? Crazy, no. All right, airplane mode, here we go. All right, if you guys have questions or anything, you can hit them right now. And as you know, I have a website that is ama.iamclovis.com. And you guys have been asking me questions today, which is for some questions, and you guys did not disappoint. I got some cool questions, some things that I'm really excited to touch on. Um, a couple of things that I don't think I've ever touched on in episode in episodes before. Maybe. I can't remember if I have for a couple of these. Um, a couple of things I just want to chat about that have been going on inside of the groups, inside of the Clovis Academy group and the I Am Clovis group in, on Facebook. So for those of you that don't know, I have private Facebook groups. There's I Am Clovis, which are my I Am Clovis members. Those are people that have purchased custom nutrition plans from me. Then we have the Clovis Academy, which is a private group as well, but that is a free group and you can just go join facebook.com slash group slash Clovis Academy. And I get questions from people, but I also keep an eye on the conversations that are happening within these groups and we had a really great uh, post go up that led to a conversation that I think is super cool that I wanted to share on the podcast as well. So we're going to tackle that tonight. Let's say hi. What's up, Judy? What's up, Sean? What's up, Tiffany? Cameron, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? What's up, Kayla? What's up, Christine? Catherine? Kayla? Jennifer? Dean, Shannon? Said Kayla. Awesome. Kayla's tagging people. Okay, cool. That's another cool thing to do. Tag people in the comments if you want them to see this episode. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff tonight. We're going to talk about culture and traditional foods and how to navigate that and kind of the myth of culture and traditional foods. A lot of people get confused about their own culture, um, me included. I went through this when I was younger. So I kind of want to touch on that with you guys and, and let you get some information you may not have on the actual food culture here in America, even as far back as like your grandparents and your great grandparents, even people that may not have lived in this country, right? So we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about something called lean mass hyper responders. Now I've touched on this briefly, but it's just uh, a conversation about cholesterol. So as you guys know, I thought that I had a specific uh, genetic condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, turns out that it's not true. And I've been on like a seven year journey trying to figure out this lipidology piece of what is the truth about cholesterol. And it turns out that nobody knows shit about cholesterol. We're like just starting to learn what cholesterol is really all about. So we're going to dig into that tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about electrolytes a little bit, electrolytes and fastings. I think that's important. I got some newbie questions coming in. Got some newbie questions about organ supplementation as well, meaning organ capsules. Uh, you guys know I'm a big fan of organ meats. So we're going to talk, talk about that a little bit. And then I had a random question about olive oil. And I don't know if I've ever talked about olive oil, but I do have, an, uh, as I am Clovis members, you have access to an affiliate deal on some really good olive oil that gets shipped right to your door, a subscription service for olive oil. So we can talk about that. We can talk about how to spot good olive oil. So it's going to be a banger episode, everybody. AMA number 80. So what's up? What's up? What's up? Hello. We're going to uh, jump in here. Sean, just got my cholesterol checked and my PCP. No, you didn't. <laughs> That's an oxymoron, getting your cholesterol checked at your PCP. It's not a real thing, okay? You have a paper with meaningless data on it. That's what you've got. You can take that paper, you can crumple it up, you can start a fire with it, you can throw it at people, you can uh, throw it into the trash directly, you can wipe your butt with it. These are all things that would be better done with that printout that you got on quote unquote cholesterol from the PCP. 
These are all things that actually make that piece of paper more valuable than the information contained on the piece of paper, okay? Your PCP knows nothing about lipidology. I can pretty much assure you that. We'll dive in, don't you worry. But what I wanna start with today was a conversation that happened in the, I can't remember if it was Clovis Academy or I Am Clovis, but it was a really good question brought up by somebody about cultural foods, meaning like cultural or quote unquote traditional foods. So this was somebody of uh, Hispanic origin that was saying that their ancestors actually ate really well. Like they had ranches and farms and they raised cattle and they fermented vegetables and all these things. But there's something that happens in um, all different cultures. A lot of these, car well, I'll call them carb heavy cultures, right? And I come from one, like I'm French, right? So French, Italian, Irish, uh, Spanish descent, Mexican, right? All these people tend to eat a lot of carbohydrates. And a lot of them tend to think that this is part of their culture or it's part of their tradition. So sometimes I'll get people that come to me and ask me what kind of foods they can and can't eat. And I'm taking away things like grains, right? So if you're someone that's used to eating a lot of tortillas, you're like, wait a second, that's not cool, man. I can't eat grains. What about corn tortillas? And I'm like, no, we don't eat corn either. Like we don't eat any grains. And you're like, wait, what? This is crazy. Or you're not eating rice or we don't eat legumes, right? So we're taking away beans or a lot of Eastern European um, descent, right? We're taking away dairy. We take away dairy at first, and then we talk about things like grass-fed butter, or some people can do all right with raw milk products, but, you know, I don't really recommend them. Honestly, you don't need them for nutrition. So I'm taking away these things that are looked at as traditional cuisines or cultural cuisines. It's like, oh, I'm taking away from my heritage or my culture or whatever, right? This is kind of a myth. So let's talk about, talk about why that is. If we really go back, all of our heritage for food is hunter-gatherers. That's what it is, right? From the, the beginning of Homo sapiens as we know them, right? We have been hunter-gatherers. Even like the countries that we have established, like France or the United States or all these places, right? It's like a blip on the radar. These things are so young. We're going back 200 years. 200 years is nothing. Like in terms of how long Homo sapiens as we know them have been around, it's like a grain of sand on a beach, right? I love in CJ Hunt's film, The Perfect Human Diet, he talks about this, like, Throughout all of Homo sapiens, that'd be like a football field. So we're looking at a football field, and that football field is like the history of our species. The last quarter inch of that 100-yard football field, the last quarter inch is the amount of time that we have had agriculture, the amount of time that we've actually stayed in one place, have not been nomadic, and have raised our own food, crops, cattle, all these things. Throughout all that other time, we were hunters, gatherers, or a combination of the two, right? So then we look back on these cultural things, like my family is French. They eat an awful lot of bread. They really like pasta, and they really like dairy, right? Italian people really like pasta, really like bread, really like pastry-type foods. There's Mexican and Spanish cultures that really like tortillas and really like rice and beans, et cetera, et cetera. And people feel like they're somehow turning their back on their heritage when they're really, really not, okay? So I want you guys to think about this. If you go back just to my grandparents, not even my great-grandparents, you have me, I'm 33 years old, I'm still considered a millennial, I like barely make the millennial cut off, then you have my parents' generation, then you have my grandparents. And my grandparents literally survived the depression that wasn't that long ago, okay? So in times of depression, in these times of immense poverty, you will see an giant increase in the amount of cheap processed carbohydrates, right? So it's going to be bread, it's going to be wheat, it's going to be bread products, things like tortillas, rice, beans, dairy, like things like cheese, right? Why is this? Because these things are incredibly shelf stable and they're very, very cheap to make, right? These are literally starvation foods, everybody. So I want you to understand that when you look back on your family's traditional foods or whatever, like, yes, your Mexican grandmother might make awesome tacos. That, that's probably legit, you know, cool. Tacos are great, you can make tacos healthy. They're not terrible, the worst thing in the world, you can do it right. But that doesn't mean that's what they wanted to eat, right? A lot of these things were passed down because of wars or famines or depressions, right? They were forced to eat these things. So if you look at it like, I could say my grandparents probably grew up eating bread and condensed milk and cheese mostly. That's probably what they got. Why? Because that is poverty food, and they were trying not to starve to death in the Great Depression, okay? So, I want you to look at it this way. If we could go all Michael J. Fox, back to the future, right, and go back in time and be with our family when they were 
13 years old at the dinner table with their parents during the Great Depression, and we were to just put their standard on the table, right? Like all the bread, all the rice, all the cheese, the probably whey, whey protein that they were eating because they let the milk curdle or whatever, right? We lay that all on the table, and right next to it, we put a bunch of big, fat-ass, grass-fed ribeye steaks and avocados and organic broccoli and sweet potatoes or Clovis food, right? We just throw down a big giant plate full of Clovis food and we go, you get to pick. Do you wanna eat these traditional foods that you're used to eating? Or do you wanna eat this awesome food? These ribeyes and sweet potatoes and broccoli and, and asparagus and avocados and whatever, right? Guaranteed, every one of them is going to choose the Clovis food. That's the way it's going to go. So what we have to do, and Jackie talked about this in the comment as well, what you have to do is separate this idea that the foods that your grandparents and your great-grandparents ate are somehow a part of your culture. I don't believe that to be true. Now, I'm an opinionated guy. I think that nutrition is far more important than these cultural norms or whatever. I think that we need to ditch most cultural norms. You guys know me. If I could break down all of my information for you, all of my advice to you in one simple statement, it would be... Everything the general public does and tells you to do, do the exact 180 opposite, and you'll be sexier, richer, happier, you'll live longer, everything about your life will be better, right? Literally just do the exact opposite of what most people tell you to do. That's how to be healthy in America, right? So you have to think about that. Like for instance, my grandmother is French, and she used to make homemade eclairs. These eclairs were just sugar and fat bombs, a perfect combination of fat and sugar, perfect for diabetes, right? So literally, my mom has a towel, that's, it's a printed kitchen towel, with my grandmother's handwritten recipe for eclairs on the towel, it's like this little keepsake that she has, right? Because we used to love eating memes, meme, because I'm French, we used to love eating memes eclairs. You could not pay me enough to eat eclairs on a regular basis as a 33-year-old man, and that does not mean that I love my meme any less, or that I'm not honoring my meme's memory by not making her eclairs, which are literally just flour, sugar, pudding, and chocolate, <laughs> right? That I'm not gonna eat that thing, but that could be considered like a traditional food, or like growing up at the table, we always had baguettes, right? We always had like French bread, we'd cut the baguettes up, and then we, then, then oh, okay, well now we're being cultural, and we're, we're eating our traditional French baguettes, and we're smothering them with country crock margarine, right? So it's like, no, isn't that true? And the same thing that I put in the comment in the in the Facebook Academy is like, we'll get this thing where Italian people will come to me. And they'll be like, well, I'm Italian. You can't take away my pasta. My family's been eating pasta for generations, right? It's like, yeah, maybe your great grandmother like made homemade pasta and boiled tomatoes and peeled them and de-seeded them and made her own delicious sauce, not like a completely different species of wheat that didn't get mass produced in America till the 1960s, which is what you now eat, which is not the same pasta that your great grandmother ate, right? You're taking Berea pasta from a box from Walmart and you're throwing it in boiling water and then taking ragu old world style pasta in a jar, you don't even know what the hell's in that and you're dumping it on your pasta and going, I'm Italian, you'll take away my pasta from my cold dead hands. These are my cultural food. No, they're not. You're buying bullshit at Walmart and pretending that it's a cultural food, okay? So <laughs> let's just be honest about that. These are not your traditional foods, everybody. We're playing tricks on ourselves, okay? Now the other thing is, what culture do you want your kids or your grandkids to follow? What traditions do you want your kids or grandkids to follow? Ladies and gentlemen, you are not your parents. You are not your grandparents. You are not your great-grandparents, okay? You simply are not. You have a family. You have a nuclear little family, right? You have a breakdown of the nuclear family, whatever. We don't go there. there. But you have your immediate family, your kids, right? Your kids are you, your kids. You can start new traditions, everybody. We used to have pancake eating contests in my house growing up. I used to eat 13 pancakes every Saturday. I held the record in my house for eating 13 pancakes. And I ate 13 pancakes in one sitting on a Saturday when I was like 12 years old. When I was 15 years old, I was 190 pounds and five foot two. That's not a good tradition, everybody. I should not have done that, okay? So you have the option to create your own culture, your own tradition within your family that you have right now. So I just want to assure you that these traditions are not what you think they are. Like for example, I mean, there was, somewhere between six and seven million working farms in America, just in the year 1900. Over 40% of all families lived on a working farm, right? 
Now there's less than one third the amount of farms almost, I think it's less than 2% of the population right now lives on a working farm, right? So you have to remember what the food sources were as well. This is what I'm saying. We have these people that even if they were eating grains or corn, they were probably growing their own corn on a farm with nutrient dense soil in the year 1910, you know, and slaughtering their own animals for red meat and getting raw milk dairy. Their dairy products certainly were not pasteurized and homogenized. I guarantee you, your great grandparents were not having pasteurized and homogenized milk. They were probably having raw milk, raw milk cheese, those kinds of things, right? It's completely different. You don't just get to say, I'm XYZ heritage or XYZ culture, right? And I get to go buy all the feedlot cheese and all the burrilla pasta in a box and all the ragu sauce and all the rice and beans and tortillas. I'm going to get Taco Bell brand tortillas from Walmart because I, because of my Mexican heritage, right? No, it doesn't. It's just silly, you guys. So look at this logically, remove the emotion from it, and just see how kind of crazy that is, right? It's still a matter of eat whole foods, change the world. Eat whole foods, change the world. Even things like bread when your great-grandparents were alive. Nothing like bread that you're finding in the grocery store today, wonder bread that can survive on a shelf for 14 days, right? It's just not, it's not good. <laughs> There's just no way around it, right? So that's just my little rant on traditional stuff. So let's chat here. What do we got? Jeff, what's your thoughts on the Mediterranean diet? So I've gone deep in the Mediterranean diet before. Um, as a starting place, it's good. It allows grains and legumes, and I think that that is completely incorrect. Um, I also believe that the Mediterranean diet has been sold to us as a myth, and we actually have data on that. So again, if you watch The Perfect Human Diet by CJ Hunt, we get into anthropological data and um, literally going through with uh, radiology and studying fossil records of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Even in the Mediterranean, they didn't eat a lot of fish. They didn't eat a lot of vegetables, okay? They just didn't. They ate, ding, 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 mostly red meat. Up to 90% of their daily caloric intake, and this is from fossilized records, right? Up to 90% of their daily caloric intake, depending on where they were, even in the Mediterranean, was mostly red meat. So the Mediterranean diet is kind of a myth. Now, we're going to talk about it uh, later on. I want to jump into this olive oil thing. Like, olive oil has been shown to be pretty great. Taking in a caloric surplus of even 3,000 calories of olive oil and not gaining weight, right? So there are some things um, people think olive oil is heart protective, um, different things that we'll talk about and think that they have antioxidant properties and all this. But in terms of the Mediterranean diet, you need to – don't think about it as what is the macronutrient breakdown, correct? Because everybody's like, oh, I want to do the Mediterranean diet because it allows like whole grains and legumes. Awesome, right? You don't want to eat those foods. I'm telling you, like there's no nutritional – you could scour the internet for the rest of your life and try to find me actual clinical data on health benefits of whole grains, and you're not going to find it. You're simply not going to. I will bet you a tremendous amount of money that you're not going to find it. Right, And the same thing goes with legumes. I really don't think legumes are necessary for your human diet, particularly if they're not soaked um, at least overnight, right? And a lot of, again, these traditional cultures would do those things. They would soak, they would peel, boil tomato. They would soak and boil at very high temperatures, legumes, right, to get the lectins off, the lectins and phytates. They didn't know that's what they were doing. They just knew, oh, my stomach hurts when I eat these. When I boil them, my stomach hurts a little less. Okay, cool. So they start doing things like that, these traditional methods. We don't have those anymore. So the Mediterranean diet, no, I, I just don't suggest it. If I were to say you have to pick for optimal human health between Clovis and the Mediterranean diet, I would say that Clovis wins that battle 100 times out of 100 times. There is not a chance in hell that you're going to switch to a Mediterranean diet and get better results than I can get you with Clovis. It's just not going to happen. And I would, I would put blood work up against it. Like I would measure blood work for blood work. Um, like let's say you did the Mediterranean diet, included grains and legumes for six months and ate mostly fish instead of red meat of Clovis, I can pretty much guarantee you that your blood work will be better. Um, that's my opinion on it at least. What else we got? I knew haggis was messed up. <laughs> yeah. Judy, my grandmother would make a homemade mayo, but we only got it every once in a while because it was hard to make back then. Yes, and traditional mayo is absolutely not bad for you. It's literally oil and eggs. That's it. Like if you want to make mayonnaise right now, get some really high quality extra virgin olive oil, put it in a bowl with eggs and whip it with a fork or whip it with a whisk or put it in a blender or whatever you want to do or put it in a food processor, right? You have homemade mayo. It's literally just fat. And you could use just egg yolks and it'll be mostly fat. You can include egg whites and you'll add some protein there. But it's literally just fat and protein. There's nothing wrong with mayonnaise. Nothing wrong. The issue with mayonnaise is store-bought mayonnaise, where the number one ingredient is usually high fructose corn syrup 
or the top three, one of the first three ingredients is usually high fructose corn syrup, and the oils that they're using are usually hydrogenated vegetable oils, mostly canola oil, safflower oil, whatever, right? Soybean oil, these are horrible, right? But if you just take extra virgin olive oil and whip it with some eggs and make your own homemade mayo, go for it, right? Absolutely. Phyllis, two questions. I do multiple fasts. Fast is water, bone broth, coffee, green tea for 10 to 15 days, and glucose still above normal like 120. How to get rid of fat that don't want to move. Done multiple fasts and weight comes off. One to three pounds for weight loss of 10 or so for a week. Current weight, 242, 5'4", and that doesn't want to go. I walk two miles a day. Yeah, okay. So one, that's a whole lot of fasting. Um, fasting is very beneficial. It can be very beneficial. Now, um, 10 to 15 days and, and glucose still above normal is you're probably type 2 diabetic. Um, most people that are diabetic don't know that they're diabetic, like over 80% of all people in the country that are type 2 diabetic don't even know that they have it, right? Over 100 million people have prediabetes and diabetes and literally over 80% of those people don't know that they have it. So one, I would get with a good functional medicine doctor for sure and I would monitor your insulin and blood glucose. Um, now 10 to 15 day fasts are really long fasts for sure. Um, if you're only doing bone broth, coffee, and water, and you're not losing fat on a 10 to 15 day fast at your particular weight, uh, which, you know, let's face it, there's a significant amount of weight to lose there, you need to get with a professional. Um, one, I would, Matt, I, would, I would be willing to say that there are some significant hormonal balances, uh, hormonal imbalances right now. I mean, significant hormonal, hormonal imbalances. If you fast for 10 to 15 days and you lose three pounds, um, there, there is, got to be so much metabolic dysfunction that you're going to need to work with a professional and untangle this thing. I would not recommend continuing to do that yourself. I would get with a with a professional. If you want me to help you do that, I can. You can email me, justin at iamclovis.com, and I can help get you with a good functional medicine doctor who's going to help you do that. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're, those are diabetic level, glucose levels, and you know, you're, you're having some serious situations there, right? I think that you really, really need some help. I think that you need to switch to Clovis or your day in, day out nutrition protocol for sure. We could talk about something like intermittent fasting and Clovis and making sure you're hitting particular macros on those days because we probably want to actually kickstart your metabolism at this point. So let's say you are significantly overweight and you have been starving yourself or doing chronic caloric deprivation and now you jump into fasting, there's gonna be significant hormonal imbalances. The body's trying to hold on to fat for starvation reasons. Uh, the body thinks it's dying even though it's not. So you're gonna to wanna to get some blood work done. You're gonna to wanna to do at least a full female hormone panel at the very least. You're gonna to wanna to measure all your thyroid levels. That includes TSH and free T3 and reverse T3 and T4, free T4, all these things, right? You're gonna to wanna to do a full thyroid panel. You're gonna to wanna to test all your steroid hormones such as you know estrogen and, and testosterone and all these things. It's very, very important. So there's a lot more to this than just fast, lose weight, right? You need to be very careful. If those numbers are not three pounds over 10 to 15 days of fasting, you gotta go work with a professional for sure. Get with a functional medicine doctor. Um, Carlo, we had jelly bean eating contests. Wow. Thank you. My doctor suggested to me. Yes, doctors are always gonna suggest it to you. I'm telling you, you gotta be really careful. Ask your doctor if he's a nutritionist. He's not. Okay. Spoiler alert. He's not. He doesn't know that much about nutrition, sorry. Eh. Unless you're dealing with a functional medicine doctor who's like also a nutritionist, right? So I'm telling you, it's just, it's, you gotta be really careful with that stuff. Everyone claims that the Mediterranean diet is heart healthy and I think the Mediterranean diet is a complete and utter myth. Is the Mediterranean diet better than the standard American, than the standard American diet? A hundred percent. If you switch from a standard American diet to the Mediterranean diet, you're gonna see significant improvements in your health. If you change from Clovis, you've been Clovis for a long time like you have, and you switch over to a Mediterranean diet, eh. I'm gonna argue that you're not gonna be happy with the results. Could be wrong, but that's my opinion, right? My grandma would use turnips instead of potatoes in soup, that's awesome. Uh, soy is everywhere in mayo now, yes. Soybean oil is in like everything right now. Actually, we'll talk about this when I talk about olive oil as well, as people are getting olive oil blends, it's ridiculous. Um, I don't know why anybody would do that. Homemade mayo is great with one cup of avocado oil. Yep, you can do it with avocado oil as well. I wish I could take you with me everywhere. I'm from Hawaii, you'll like it here. I love Hawaii, it's fantastic. Um, and I just got scuba certified, so I'm probably gonna go to Hawaii at some point. But my dad, my dad went there a few months ago and did some crazy dives in Hawaii and I'm hoping to do and the same thing. I'm just gonna get my open water dive out of the way to complete my certification. Then I'm gonna go scuba diving everywhere. I'm gonna go back to Mykonos, Greece. I'm gonna go to Croatia. It's gonna be awesome. So, all right, let's dive in here. So uh, let's let's hit this olive oil question because it kind of works. We're going with this, um, you know, traditional foods and stuff. So it's just a question what to look for when choosing olive oil. Supermarket brands are confusing. Yes, of course they're confusing, and that's purposeful, right? So 
one, don't buy olive oil in the store. Don't, like really don't. I mean, if you really wanna be a nerd about this, um, don't buy olive oil in the store. I don't buy olive oil in the store at all. I'm lucky there's a place here in Nashville. Uh, if you live anywhere near the Nashville Franklin area, it's called Urban Market, H-E-R-B-A-N, which is hilarious because sometimes my credit card company declines the charges because it thinks I'm buying marijuana. It's really funny. Um, but it's called Urban Market. And you go to Urban Market, and Urban Market actually has a whole spread that is a tasting bar for olive oil. I mean, they got to have 100 olive oils in there. It's crazy. You get these little cups, and you can taste the olive oil, and you can drink it. So there's all these different things when you're looking for olive oil. But the cool thing about tasting it is there's this stuff called ole oleocanthin. There's oleocanthin or some, it's like oleic acid, these different types of things. But this oleocanthin, I think I'm saying that correctly, is like the main antioxidant found in olive oil that people attribute a lot of the benefits to. So you, when you get to taste the olive oil, one, it'll show you like the oleocanthin amounts on these really good tasting places like this place. I mean, these, these bottles of olive oil are, are $26 a piece. You know, they're, they're fancy olive oils. They're all imported from all over the world. But you taste it, there's like a peppery bitterness in the back of your throat. And the more it tastes like pepper, the higher the level of oleic acid in this oleocanthin stuff, right? Um, so it's really cool. You get to taste it and you feel that kind of peppery taste in your tongue, in the back of your throat, and you know that that olive oil has a lot of antioxidant capacity in it, right? So what you wanna look for when you're looking for olive oils is a lot of people talk about this cold pressed stuff. They say get cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. One, you want to get extra virgin olive oil 100% because if you don't get extra virgin olive oil, you can't be sure that it's actually olive oil or at least not 100% olive oil. But even cold press isn't quite enough. There's actually another term called cold extracted. So you wanna look for cold extracted extra virgin olive oil. And that extra virgin olive oil needs to be fresh. And unlike most other things that we talk about in terms of filtration, you actually want your extra virgin olive oil to be filtered, okay? So there's a couple things we've just touched on. We've touched on cold extracted extra virgin olive oil that is filtered. It's filtered and it has to be fresh. So the issue with Freshness, buying in a store, you're not getting fresh olive oil. You're just not going to. It's gonna give you an expiration date that's two years out. Most of these olive oils are in clear packaging. That's the other thing. You want to get dark glass bottles for your olive oil, right? Dark glass bottles. If it's in a clear plastic container, that's probably rancid olive oil. It's been hit with sunlight. It's been in and out of non-temperature controlled trucks. It's been shipped all over the country. You don't really know how old it is, right? So it's really, you just don't wanna buy olive oil in the store. And there's this other thing that people are doing right now, which is light olive oil, like literally, like light as in like, people are still worried about fat being bad for them, which is hilarious in 2019. But they get these light olive oils because it has less calories or they're, they're just literally selling it. It's like Miller Light versus Miller, or like Bud Light versus Budweiser, right? They're selling it as light olive oil, which is just crazy. Now what happens in those scenarios is like 70% of that mix is probably canola oil or some other kind of industrial seed oil or vegetable oil, and you're probably getting 30% olive oil. So don't buy anything except for extra virgin olive oil. There's also something called IOC, and IOC is the International Olive Oil Council. So there's some kind of certification from the IOC that lets you know that you're actually getting an olive oil product. Um, but again, you want to store it in cool, dark places. You preferably want to have a dark glass bottle. And one quick trick to check for the purity of olive oil is if you put it in your refrigerator and it remains liquid, it's not olive oil, okay? So if you take that olive oil bottle that you have and you stick it in your fridge overnight or something and you come back and it's completely liquid, it's not olive oil. You don't want to drink that. It's not pure olive oil, right? So actual pure olive oil should solidify in the refrigerator overnight if it's pure, okay? So those are a couple things to look out for. And people just rave about the antioxidant capacity of olive oil and they say that it's heart protective and all these things. And that's the thing about the Mediterranean diet that drives me nuts is people talk about the Mediterranean diet being heart healthy. And the reason for that is because of things like olive oil, which is extremely high fat, and oleic acid, which is literally just a monounsaturated fatty acid, right? So they preach this oleic acid is heart protective and fish is somehow heart protective right? With these healthy fats and omega-3s, right? This is all fat, fat, fat. Fat is heart protective. Fat is heart protective. Fat is heart protective. Fat is heart protective. That is the argument for the Mediterranean diet. And yet somehow in America, we'll still like, red meat and animal fat will kill you. You'll have a heart attack. <laughs> Wait, what? Like the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet is literally preached as like the most heart healthy diet on planet earth just because of all the fat that you eat, right? And they're like, well, it's monounsaturated fat versus saturated fat. Well, it's ridiculous, right? So 
The idea of eating fat, being healthy, is 100% true. Fat is good for you. Without it, you die. And that's the argument for olive oils. This oleic acid is just a monounsaturated fat. And then you have this oleocanthin and all these different antioxidant compounds. They're also called polyphenols that are in the olive oil that they claim it's heart protective. And there was a study done where people, I think it was the, over the course of a four-week study, they had like a 3,000 calorie, 3, calorie per week caloric surplus from olive oil, literally drizzling olive oil, basically drinking olive oil. 3,000 extra calories a week of olive oil and an actual decrease in body fat percentage. So actually change their body composition to lose fat with an additional 3,000 calories, which again, people say, you eat 3,500 calories, you're gonna gain a pound, right? An extra 3,000 calories a week for four weeks and these people lost fat just with adding that healthy fat of olive oil, right? So anyway, just a little rant on olive oil and if you're a member of I Am Clovis, you actually have a discount that you get on a fresh pressed olive oil club, right? So you have olive oil just shipped to your door. I tend to do these things on subscription services. Like my avocado oil is a subscription service from Ava Jane's Kitchen. And my olive oil club, I'm part of olive oil club. So the olive oil I get can get shipped directly to my door. Now, olive oil club for me, normally I end up pausing it because I like to just go to Urban Market in Nashville. But I'm really lucky that I have a world-class market for olive oil in my city, right? That's pretty unbelievable. Um, Jeff. Your diet has changed my world, and I thank you for that. Love my Clovis. Thank you so much. I love you. Thank you for trusting me and for following my advice. It really means the world to me. It still blows my mind every day like that people just trust me with their health. It's it's amazing. I mean, I get it. I have the results to back it up, you know, but um, I still love it. It's, it's astonishing to me that people will take something that sacred of, like, their health and literally put it in my hands. It's unbelievable. So I wanted to talk a little bit on olive oil. I thought that was cool. And another quick one was uh, somebody asked me for my opinion on beef liver organ supplements. So uh, beef liver organ supplements, of course, as you guys know, I've been raving about this forever. Um, so I am an ambassador for Paleo Valley and their organ complex. So you can actually get a discount on Paleo Valley's grass-fed organ complex, which comes in capsule form. You can get a discount on that if you're a member of Iron Clovis. So go to ironclovis.com slash start and sign up. That's the thing. Your membership for Iron Clovis is $27 a month. You purchase like two or three items and you make that back every month. There's no way that your Iron Clovis membership shouldn't pay for itself. I'm partnered with like 40 different brands. Not to mention the discounts you get in my store, 10% off everything. You get $250 off your custom macros. What? It's the ambassador program. You make 20% signing your friends up. There's no way your I Am Clovis membership should not pay for itself in the first week of every month. Absolutely. If it's not paying for itself, you're just not taking advantage of it, right? So uh, you should be doing that. But anyway, yes, I'm a huge fan of these organ capsules. But the thing to remember here is it's far more cost effective and far healthier for you to consume organ meats. So I hated the taste of organ meats, hate, hate, hated the taste of organ meats, and went and talked to a guy when I was in Croatia that had lived with like 60 indigenous tribes all across the world and talked about the, just the magical powers of eating organ meats. And he's like, dude, stop with the capsules, stop trying to freeze them and take them as a pill. He's like, you need to man up, go home, cook organ meats and eat them every day until you like them. And that's what I did. I took four ounces of beef liver, grass-fed beef liver, which I get for $3 a pound, mind you, from a local farm, $3 a pound for grass-fed beef liver. And that grass-fed beef liver lasts me four days because I eat four ounces a day. So I take, I cut it kind of thin, I take uh, slice it kind of thin, four ounces of grass-fed beef liver, throw it on a skillet, medium-high heat, 90 seconds one side, 90 seconds on the other side, done, I eat it. I did that for weeks, probably about two weeks before I really started to like the flavor. Now, I crave it. If I have a day where I have not had my organ meats, I literally feel different. It's like nature's perfect multivitamin, right? So the thing to remember here is that that four ounces of liver that I eat every day is 113 grams of beef liver. Now, in four capsules of an organ complex, you're gonna get 2.4 grams of organ, freeze-dried organ meats, 2.4 grams. That means for my daily four ounce serving of liver, you'd have to take 188 pills, okay? So you'd have to take 188 pills to get the same micronutrient density of the four ounces of liver that I just eat every day. So obviously it makes more sense to eat whole foods. That said, supplements are there for a reason. They're super convenient. I travel with organ supplements um, because I, I never know if I'm gonna be able to get organ meats where I'm, going, where I'm going. So I travel with them and I tend to take a double dose every day because I think it's super important. So I go through them a little faster, but again, they're super important. They're super convenient and some people just aren't gonna eat organ meats, they're not. Or maybe for your kids, you can pop them open and sprinkle stuff um, you know, get your kids to eat organ meats that way. So they're super convenient. Yes, I highly recommend them. I highly recommend Paleo Valley's Organ Complex. And um, if you want a discount on that, become an I Am Clovis member. So yeah, to answer your question, I'm a huge fan of that. Let's see what we got here. What about metabolic typing? Um, metabolic typing. So 
what exactly do you mean by metabolic typing? Give me a little bit more uh, information there because I think I know what direction you're going in, but I think that all human metabolisms are essentially the same way. Like biochemistry is biochemistry, right? The only reason that metabolic typing would come into play is if you have a metabolic dysfunction. So if you have a metabolic dysfunction, the goal is to get back to a working metabolism. That's always the goal. What happens in medicine and nutrition is people use things as crutches. It's like, oh, I have a broken ankle, so I'm going to put a cast on and I'm never gonna take it off for the rest of my life. That wouldn't make any sense, right? So if you have a broken metabolism, you need to fix your metabolism. You need to not cater to your broken metabolism. That would just be silly, right? Biochemistry is biochemistry. Insulin, blood glucose, all these things, they, they work a specific way. We need to get them back to where they should be. So if your, metabol if your metabolic health right now is not good, if there's metabolic dysfunction, we can and should fix that. We shouldn't cater to it in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's the same way that people do. I'm an ectomorph or a mesomorph and all these things. I have this body type. I'm just going to be overweight or whatever. No, it doesn't work that way. Or particularly, I've already debunked like the blood type diet, getting into eating for your blood type and all that complete, complete, complete and utter nonsense. Um, so you got to be careful with that stuff. But uh, let me know exactly what you're what you're talking about there, and then we can dive, dig in a little bit more. Love Paleo Valley Organ Complex and their Vitamin C Complex. Yes, they have amazing, amazing products. Mike, sub J Dog, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? Travis just recently added beef heart into my daily meals. Nearly double the protein per ounce compared to regular beef at half the cost. Yes, beef heart is amazing. And dude, Travis, tell the people how delicious beef heart is. Because I'm telling you, if you cook beef heart right, it's like you're eating like the most juicy fillet you've ever eaten. It tastes like steak. It just tastes like a delicious steak. And beef heart, particularly if you're going around local farms and stuff, I mean, you can get organ meats for super cheap. They're practically giving them away. The guy that I get my beef liver from here in Tennessee, he was like, oh man, it's amazing that you started buying beef liver from me. The only time I sell liver is when people buy it for their dog food. I'm like what? I'll take all your organs, please. I want the brains. I want the kidneys. I want the thyroids. I want the spleens. I want the livers. I want all of it. So um, yeah, I really... Highly recommend organ meats and beef heart is absolutely delicious. It's fantastic, right? Okay, so what else we got here? There was another question. Oh, this was a cool question. Okay, so what do you recommend? What are we looking at for time here? We're about 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so what do you recommend to keep your electrolytes balanced during a longer fast? And this is a cool question because the truth is your electrolyte balance really doesn't change while you're fasting, even extended fasts. Uh, fastest, that's a word, right? Fastest, extended fasts. Um, the electrolyte balance really doesn't change. You don't really deplete too much sodium or magnesium or potassium or anything like that, right? Um, there is like, there's something called fat refeeding syndrome with fasting, but this is like a phosphorus issue and that's a whole different ballgame. You're really not going to run into that. That happened with like prisoner of wars, like literally prisoners of war in camps that were like completely malnourished for extended periods of time. Um, really, really not the same thing as your extended fast that you want to do, right? So if you're talking about fasting, you really don't need to worry about electrolytes. Now, generally speaking, I tell people to supplement electrolytes when they're fasting, but you have to understand the why behind that. So details matter, right? Details always matter. So the reason why I have people supplement electrolytes is because a lot of people are coming to me getting off of a standard American diet. Maybe they've been Clovis for a week or two weeks, or they want to jump right into fasting from day one. If they're coming off a high carbohydrate standard American diet, Anytime you switch to a low carbohydrate diet, your insulin levels are going to drop and your kidneys are going to secrete more sodium. This is just a natural thing that occurs in the body, okay? So what happens is you are going to spit out, literally just excrete extra electrolytes. So extra electrolyte supplementation is a really good idea. Part of the keto flu that people call it, the sugar, de I just call it the sugar detox, but part of that sugar detox is actually electrolyte de depletion. You're losing more electrolytes than you're used to, right? So it's a really good idea to supplement. The easiest way to do this, even when you're fasting, is Redmond sea salt. Get some Redmond sea salt. Again, gram for gram is the cheapest way to do this, right? I start every morning with three grams of sodium, which is five full grams of Redmond sea salt. I have five full grams of Redmond sea salt in 16 ounces of water each and every morning. And I actually add some magnesium to that as well. I use Natural Calm and add some magnesium to that. So I get electrolytes first thing in the morning. But I want you to understand, you don't have to do that with fasting. It just makes it more pleasant, right? You're not going to get those horrible sugar detox symptoms. It's really going to help with some of those nasty symptoms that would make you want to quit the fast or whatever, particularly if you're not fat adapted. You're going to have a hell of a time coming off that sugar detox. Everybody does. So the electrolytes kind of help that. Now, my favorite way for you to get in these minerals, these vitamins and minerals and these electrolytes is through bone broth fasting. I think bone broth fasting is fantastic. If you come to me and you've got 100 plus pounds to lose, which a lot of you do come to me with 100 plus pounds to lose, 
a bone broth fast is one of the best things you can do. Now, again, we just had somebody come in and ask about doing these bone broth fasts for 10 to 15 days and only losing three pounds. Okay, now we need to untangle that mystery. We need to see what kind of hormonal imbalances are at play. We need to see what else is kind of blocking things up. We need to see what the deal is there, right? You probably want to work with a professional at that point, and I'm limited in what I can do. I can't draw blood work for you and analyze your blood work, right? But I can point you in the direction of great functional medicine doctors who can. But generally speaking, if you're obese and you do a 14-day bone broth fast, I mean, I've had women drop 27 pounds in 14 days doing bone broth fast. There are people who reverse type 2 diabetes, literally. I know that the doctors don't want you saying that, and I'm not saying I've done it, but no, you know, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. Liability, right? But Dr. Jason Fung talks about this all the time, literally like reversing people's type 2 diabetes completely inside of six weeks just using extended fasting. Right? It's like they get completely off insulin, they get completely off metformin, their glucose levels level out, their insulin levels level out. Now, does that happen for everybody? No, of course not. We can't guarantee that. Um, but fasting is great for that. And bone broth fasting is really the way to go, in my opinion, there. Because if the number one goal is fat loss, why not bone broth fast? Have two, three cups of bone broth a day. You're going to get 20, 30 grams of protein. This would be something called like a protein sparing modified fast or a fasting mimicking protocol, right? So you're literally just taking in 10 grams of collagen per cup of bone broth. So as we know, protein calories do not work like other calories in the body. They just don't. They're not stored for energy, right? So you can drink probably two to four cups of bone broth a day and get, you know, 10 to 40 grams of protein and still drop body fat like crazy. You can go into deep ketosis. You can just fry through your body fat. It's a fantastic way. It's the fastest way to drop blood glucose and insulin levels, which is a fantastic thing to do if you're overweight. Um, just remember that the only thing you're not going to get with all that protein is autophagy. So for somebody like me, who's very lean with a low body fat percentage, I fast for the autophagy benefits, these longevity anti-aging benefits, right? Anti-cancer benefits, all these things. That's kind of why I want to fast. That said, I do a lot of other things that induce autophagy themselves. Drinking black coffee can induce autophagy. Heavy resistance training can induce autophagy. Um, sauna use, and I do daily infrared sauna use in my home, right? That induces an autophagy, right? So I don't really need to worry too much about autophagy, and I do a daily 16-hour 16 16 intermittent fast. Now, again, I'm not saying everyone does that, but that's what I like to do, right? So I fast 16 hours a day. I use infrared sauna. I take cold showers. I lift heavy things, right? I got plenty of autophagy going on, so I'm not really worried about it. But if I were an obese person, um, I would absolutely do a bone broth fast and make it more feasible to make sure I can go longer, and you're getting a boatload of electrolytes. So there's sodium in bone broth already and other electrolytes, but you can actually add red and sea salt to your bone broth, makes the bone broth a little bit more tasty, and it's just a great way to do an extended fast. So in terms of how to manage your electrolyte balance during extended fast, um, I would recommend bone broth, absolutely. Bone broth or just supplementing something like red and sea salt. Four ounce of any organ meat takes the daily nutrients for the day. Um, you'd have to look that up, man. Uh, Probably, it's basically like nature's ultimate multivitamin, but all organ meats are going to be different. Like um, kidneys are going to have different micronutrients than beef liver. Beef liver is going to have different micronutrients than brains. Brains is going to have different micronutrients than a spleen, right, or a heart. So you got to look into that yourself and just kind of see. But yeah, a great way to cover all your bases is to consume organ meats. Um, what else we got here? Love my salt. Me too. Just fasted three days, amazingly easy, love it. Don't know why I didn't do it before. Yeah, fasting really isn't that difficult. Now, again, Shelly, remember, you've been Clovis for a long time. So if you came into this in day one, that three-day fast would have been a lot more difficult. When people come to me and they're not even close to fat adapted, like they haven't done Clovis for a long time, they haven't lost a lot of body fat, they haven't really experienced what happens when your body starts to burn fat for fuel, when their body's not that metabolically healthy, um, when they're suffering from metabolic inflexibility where they can only burn sugar for fuel, then fasting is really, really tricky in the beginning. It can be really difficult. There's some serious hunger pains, some serious headaches and things like that. You've been Clovis for so long that you're not going to have those same symptoms, which is which is really cool. That's amazing. And now that you know fasting is easy, I mean, do more of it. Honestly, I think it's great. Not all the time. Don't go crazy with it or whatever. But like, as long as you have significant body fat to lose, I'm a big fan of fasting. I really am. And again, you could try this again. You could try a bone broth fast. As a member of I Am Clovis, you get a discount on bone broth as well, on kettle and fire bone broth. So you can get super cheap kettle and fire bone broth with your Clovis discount and do try a seven-day bone broth fast. Drink two, three, four cups of bone broth every day, whatever you need to do to keep you going, right? Add salt to that bone broth. Try to do just two cups a day, like maybe one in the morning, one in the evening, and see how you do. And then if you need more on day five, then drink a little bit more, you know? But I'm telling you, fry body fat off you. I mean, literally just, just spit body fat off your body. It's ridiculous um, if you can do this kind of fasting stuff. 
even with the bone broth. So try that out. And again, purchase the perfect fasting protocol. Go to iamclovis.com, click on eBooks, and get my perfect fasting protocol, and I will walk you through exactly how to do bone broth fast. All the different types of fasts. I talk about intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, extended fasting, autophagy fast, fat fast, which is a completely different thing, um, and this protein sparing modified fast, which is basically taking in nothing but protein. Drop 10 pounds as of this AM, all water. Probably not all water. Um, I would be willing to bet that you lost some body fat there for sure. Um, I don't think that you'll, if you just start drinking water, I don't think you're going to get all that 10 pounds back. But when you start eating, all that 10 pounds shouldn't come back. That's the beauty of this. Uh, you really are burning fat, right? The bandwagon now is metabolic typing, slow oxidizer to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's exactly what I was afraid of. It's, it is exactly what it sounds like, and it sounds like complete nonsense to me. Um, what you have to do is get back to basic metabolic health. Human metabolism is human metabolism. This human metabolism is not one of these things that is individualized, in my opinion. Your gut microbiome could be a little bit different. Um, your genetics and epigenetics can be a little bit different. But in terms of like, I eat macronutrient. Said macronutrient spikes insulin. Blood glucose goes up. Insulin takes said glucose, stores it in cells, burns it for energy, puts it as muscle glycogen, converts glucose into triglycerides, or converts fatty acids plus glucose into triglycerides, or creates cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. This is all biochemistry. This happens in everybody, right? This is across the board, right? You're a human being. So I think that it's gonna get really dangerous if people start talking about, we need specific things for specific types of metabolism. No, human metabolism is human metabolism. And if human metabolism is not behaving properly, that just means there's metabolic dysfunction and you need to fix it. And again, fixing it is not like putting a cast on a broken arm and leaving it there forever. It's like, oh, you don't oxidize fats well. Okay, so for instance, somebody might come to me and they can't burn fat in the beginning because they're metabolically inflexible. That's a problem. That's not something that you accept and say like, so slow oxidizer to me, what they must be taught, I, I can just look at this and I don't even know what this thing is, but this slow oxidizer thing must mean that you're probably somebody who doesn't oxidize fats well right? Because we have aerobic and anaerobic, meaning with oxygen or without oxygen, right? When you burn fatty acids for ATP to create ATP, which is the energy currency of the body, when you create ATP, oxygen is required. So somebody saying I'm a slow oxidizer is probably saying I don't burn fat well, which just means that you're metabolically inflexible and you need to fix that, right? So you absolutely need to fix it. You wouldn't want to cater to that. So the, I, I, I mean, I couldn't imagine someone saying like, oh, I'm a slow oxidizer, so I need to eat a high carb diet instead of a high fat diet because I don't burn fat very well. That's a crazy thing to say. That just means you're metabolically inflexible and you need to, to fix it, right? So um, yeah, I'll look into that more because I admittedly have not dove deep into this metabolic typing thing, but uh, and the fact that it's a new bandwagon, that sounds like fun, right? So I guess I'll go check it out. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. I'll check it out. Um, what else we got? If I went on a two week fast and say I lose 20 pounds, would that 20 pounds stay off and I begin eating Clovis skin? Yeah, probably, probably most of it, right? You're not going to shed. 20 pounds of water. You're not just gonna have 20 pounds of water evaporate from you and then go back to eating and 20 pounds of water come back. You know what I'm saying? It just, it doesn't work that way. Now, of course, some some weight could come back for sure, absolutely. You're gonna go back to eating foods. Like I've told you guys in mass gains, I've shifted my weight from morning to night over 11 pounds, right? Over 11 pounds in a single day. So here's the real thing I'm concerned about, Carla, is you've been Clovis for a very long time and I don't wanna put you in the hot seat here, but why would you give a shit about that 20 pounds? That's my question. Why would you care? See, what I would prefer you do is before you do a fast, you get a body composition test done. So before the fast, get a body composition test, something like InBody or a DEXA scan or a BodPod scan or something like that, and it might say you're 30% body fat, and then you might fast for two weeks, and all of a sudden you might be 25% body fat, and then go back to eating two weeks later, your body weight might go up and your body fat might still stay at 25%. So now we're talking about body composition. I don't care about the scale. I cannot say this enough. I can't say this 10 million times daily for infinity. I could not say it enough times how much I don't care about body weight. I mean, when you have 100 plus pounds to lose, yes, we need to talk about body weight. We need to get you down to a healthy body weight, right? But in terms of this, like you should not be measuring the success of a nutritional protocol just based on body weight loss. You shouldn't be doing that, okay? If you really wanna test a 14-day fast, then you should get a body composition test done and really see what you're doing there, right? And then you have to worry about weight coming back. What else we got? Oh, Shelly, you didn't mean only water. Wait, I see, you meant only water. That's a great fast, awesome, you did a great job. I meant only drank water, no hunger pains, just amazing to me, right? It's incredible. I mean, 
I tell people this all the time, they think I'm a psychopath. So I'm like, dude, I've done five day water fast and done two workouts a day, like CrossFit workout in the morning and jujitsu at night. Zero food in five days in a row. People are like, what? The, what do you mean? How are you not dead? Because it just doesn't work that way. It's like you don't need these things that people think you need. It's really crazy how many myths you can just destroy. That's why I'm on Clovis, Danielle. Good answer. I love that. Awesome. Yes. Um, what else we got here? Yeah, that's the thing about fasting too is, I mean, you'll have people that fast and they are convinced they're dying. Like, <laughs> I do think there's a mindset piece to this. I mean, I think fasting is probably mostly mindset, but like, you got to understand hunger pains come in waves. Hunger pains are not compounding. No one that's ever fasted doesn't know that. They just feel super like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. I'm going to pass out. No, you're not. Drink a glass of water and wait 15 minutes. You won't be hungry anymore, right? Hunger pains generally do not last more than 20 minutes. So if you can't suffer for 20 minutes, and you got to work on yourself as a human, right? Because I do a lot of things that are way harder than fasting for 20 minutes. Um, I mean, really, it's just stressors in the body, acute stressors in the body are totally healthy. They're good. They cause the body to adapt. You get people that fast for a day and they're like, I was going to die. I was going to pass out. I had to. I just drank a bunch of orange juice. I ate a Snickers bar, whatever. Like, I was going to die. I'm so hungry. Oh, I was at work. I, it was a busy day at work, man. You don't know. Like, when I have to work, I need food. No, you don't. You're literally just making that up. You're all making it up. Okay? I'm not saying you guys, because a lot of you have done great in fasting, but I have people all the time in Clovis that try fasting. No, dude, you just don't understand. That's what they'll tell me. Justin, you don't understand. It's easy for you. I thought I was going to die. I was going to I had to eat food. It was so bad. It was so bad. All right, dude. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to tell you, right? You got to just make a decision for yourself that you're going to improve. That's it, right? I worked out last night during, and yes, everyone freaking out. Yeah, work out fasted. Why the hell not, right? You pretty as long as you're doing aerobic training, you're pretty much guaranteed to burn body fat while fasted, right? That's fantastic. Now, I did a bunch of glycolytic training and was still fine, right? And I actually did blood glucose tests to show people, like before my workout, I take a blood glucose test. It might be 60, 63, right? And then I do a workout and it might be 119, 120, right? I'm like, whoa, my blood glucose spiked as if I ate a full meal. Why? Because I did put a place to glycolytic demand on the body. My body said, we need to create glucose. This is something called gluconeogenesis, okay? So the body creates glucose when it needs it based on the demand placed upon the body. It doesn't just create glucose for no reason. It creates glucose when it needs to based on the demand placed in the body. So there are some things that you need glucose for. Glycolytic activity, you need to burn glucose for that. You don't have access to glucose, the body will make it. So the takeaway on all this fasting talk is stop being babies. If you fast for less than 24 hours and you write me an email saying, you don't understand, Justin, I felt like I was going to die, you're simply wrong. Stop being a baby, okay? I love you. I want you to be healthy. Stop being a baby. Okay. What else we got here? So the other thing I wanted to chat about really quick, we only got a couple minutes left here. Oh, wow. It's 8.57. Shoot. Jeez. Okay. So I do want to touch on this real quick. There's this idea that I touched on called a lean mass hyperresponder. If you guys know this about me, I have literally traveled the country working with some of the best lipidologists alive. And that is because my uncle almost died of a widowmaker heart attack. All of my dad's uncles have had heart attacks. Um, my dad had arterial plaque. I got tested and had arterial plaque at 30 years old, right? So we thought that we had this crazy genetic cholesterol condition called familial hypercholesterolemia. And I've actually said in podcasts, I have familial hypercholesterolemia. That's not true. I have since determined that I think that to be completely false. Um, I've worked with expert MDs such as Paul Saladino, who you guys know and love, and, um, and that's not the case. So I've been introduced to this concept called lean mass hyperresponders. These are people with very low body fat, and it doesn't even actually have to be very low body fat. Like very low body fat in America is like anything under 25% for a guy. It's ridiculous, right? If you're 18 to 25% body fat, I need to cut body fat off you as a man. I'm not happy. You're not lean, okay? If you're 18%, do not think that you are lean. That's not a lean person, okay? But in terms of medicine and average people in reference ranges in America, the average body fat in America is between 30 and 40%. So we think that 18% is lean, which is not lean, okay? But anyway, I digress. So lean mass hyperresponders. These are people with low body fat percentage, very low triglycerides, but sky high LDL particle number, right? My LDL particle number is so high that any conventional doctor in the world would promise me that if I don't get put on a statin drug, I'm gonna drop dead tomorrow of a heart attack, right? Um, to give you an example, my LDL particle number is over 3,500 in terms of uh, millimoles or nanomoles, I believe. Um, in terms of if that was 
milligrams, I think, per deciliter, it'd be about 200, right? So people would freak out with an LDLP of 200. They would just lose their absolute shit, and the doctors would be like, here's the highest dose of statin drug possible, right? But what, th this is what I want to chat about. There, so I had a, a male client come to me, and all of his blood work improved, staggeringly improved. But his LDLP went up, and his total cholesterol went up. And he freaked out. Like, dude, I've been on Clovis for four weeks and my blood work is terrible. My doctor's flipping out. They wants me to stand drug. You say my blood work is terrible. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. I can't give you medical advice. What I want to tell you is that there comes a point in your Clovis journey where you need to make a decision. Do you trust your primary care physicians to give you the best possible advice for your health and wellness? If you do, then go ahead and do what they tell you to do. You need to know that I do not have a primary care physician. I do not trust conventional medicine at all with my health. I do not take any pharmaceutical drugs. I would never be caught dead taking a statin drug, personally, okay? I'm not going to do that. I have made my decision. And you can see, you can look at me right now, everybody. You can look at my body fat percentage. You can look at my health. You can look at all the things I put out online. You can look at the results I get in other people. My results speak for themselves. The results of my clients speak for themselves, okay? But it's up to you to make a decision. When you switch to Clovis, this particular person wanted to do a mass gains protocol, which means I'm gonna have him eating a whole lot of red meat, which means his LDLP might skyrocket, which means his total cholesterol might skyrocket, right? But then we'll look at things like LDLC, we'll look at HDL, right? So the HDL number is going to go up. So this lean mass hyper responder is literally low body fat percentage, high HDL, good cholesterol, very low triglycerides. My triglycerides are extremely low, like the best they can possibly be. Right now, on top of that, we may actually have an above average fasted glucose level. Right, so my fasted glucose level might be a little bit higher than somebody might expect for someone like me who's been fat adapted for years. Okay, but this is because I have low glycogen stores in my system because I eat a very low carbohydrate diet. So I have low glycogen stores, very low body fat, a little bit higher than normal glucose, very high HDL very low triglycerides, sky high, L, sky high LDL particle number, and sky high total cholesterol. This is something literally you can Google it, a lean mass hyper responder, right? So I'm a particular type of person that's literally reframing the entire way that the medical community thinks about cholesterol. Now, what I mean by this is that all of the cholesterol data we have for nutrition science was done on a sick population. What do I mean? One of the number one factors for cardiovascular risk, literally cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular events, one of the number one factors, inflammation is a huge one, but another one is insulin resistance, okay? So we're looking at, is LDL particle number bad? Oh, we have studies that show a correlation between LDL particle number and cardiac events, but the entire population, something like over 82% of Americans are insulin resistant or have some level of insulin resistance. So we actually, according to the data, have no idea how LDL particles behave in the system in a population that is not insulin resistant aka me, the lean mass hyper responders. We are a completely different type of human being. They need to do a large scale clinical trial that's in a metabolic ward and they need to study lean mass hyper responders. They absolutely have to do it. Why? Because they're now proving that things like high LDL particle number are protective against things like cancer, Alzheimer's, and dementia, right? So my high LDL particle number that any conventional medicine doctor would wanna put me on a statin for could protect me against things like cancer, Alzheimer's, and dementia. Oh, did I mention I lost two of my grandparents to Alzheimer's and dementia and lost one of my grandparents to a stroke, right? And all of their doctors told them to eat low-fat diets, high-grain diets, and they all still died of those things anyway, right? So we think about it. We might have this entire thing backwards. I think the, the, the massive way that we found that refined processed carbohydrates kill people I think we're going to find the same thing of lowering cholesterol. I really do. And you have to understand that the pharmaceutical companies are totally in bed with government and nutrition science and all that. They pay for nutrition science. It used to be that over 300 cholesterol was high. Then they lowered it. Over 250 was high. Then they lowered it even more. Now over 200. You can be at 205 and your doctor's going to try to put you on a statin drug, okay? So the whole reason for this rant is there has to come a time in your journey where you become your own detective, you do your own research, and you form your own opinions. I can't form these opinions for you. The guy that I was speaking to, if I were in his shoes, I would completely ignore the advice of that doctor. If I were him, but I'm not, so I'm not telling him to do that. I wanna be clear about that. I'm not telling him to do that. But I am saying, me, personally, I come to my own conclusions, man. I do, that's all there is to it. 
and my conclusions and my research, which has been painstaking for seven years, I have been researching my own cholesterol issues, right? I've been researching it like crazy. And I'm healthier and happier than I have ever been, and my LDLP is off the charts, and my total cholesterol is super high, and I have, oh, not to mention inflammation, the number one risk factor of cardiovascular disease, the number one risk factor being inflammation. My inflammation doesn't even show up in the reference range. It doesn't even measure on blood work. It's below reference range. I have no inflammation in my body. So we also don't know how LDL particle number behaves in a body with no inflammation in it. Because if you have high insulin, you have insulin resistance, guaranteed you have systemic inflammation. Guaranteed. So you're running around with a C-reactive protein number of 5.6 while mine is 0.01. And your doctor wants to put you on a stat in the same way he wants to put me on a stat. And that's insane, right? So what I'm saying to you is I want to warn you, when you switch to Clovis, you will have things happen like you will drop all of your body fat. Your energy will go through the roof. You'll sleep better than ever. Your sex life with your partner will be better than ever. Everything about your life is going to be amazing. Your clothes are going to fall off you. They're not going to fit. And your doctor is going to try to convince you based on a shitty blood test that you are killing yourself. Regardless of all the other benefits and results that you see, your doc is going to try to convince you that you are a crazy person and that that Justin dude on the, on the internet is trying to kill you. That's what they're going to try to do. And you have to make a decision at that point. The same way that Jeff just came on here and said that the doctor is trying to put them on a Mediterranean diet. Why? Why do you need a Mediterranean diet if you're on Clovis and you're super healthy and all your blood work is normal? Why do you need to change anything, right? So I need you to understand that somewhere down the line, you're going to follow my advice and your blood work is not going to go in the direction that a conventional medical doctor wants the blood work to go and they're going to challenge you. And you need to be prepared to stand up for yourself you need to be prepared to stand up and walk out of the room and find a new doctor if you need to, okay? I just wanted to touch on this because it's super important, so I'm going to end the episode with that, but you need to be willing to stand up for what you believe in, do your own research. If you guys want, I'm going to put a video about, um, about lean mass hyperresponders in the show notes. So at Clovis.show, I always have all the show notes, go to Clovis.show. So once this drops tomorrow, the podcast episode, you can listen to the podcast, I'll put up the show notes, and at any time, you can just go to Clovis.show and search lean mass hyperresponder, or just type in lean mass or hyperresponder, like I'll ta I tag everything, right? So if you search like lean mass or lean mass hyperresponder, this episode will pop up, and I'm gonna put a video in the show notes that teaches you exactly what a lean mass hyperresponder is. When I saw this video, it was like I had seen the light. I was like, oh my God, I've been struggling with this for seven years years trying to figure out what this is and this is exactly it it's just that i'm so much healthier than everybody else that they had no fucking idea what i was they had no idea how my human metabolism works because i'm too healthy that's literally what has happened here it's insanity right i can't turn anyway i can't turn anywhere to get good nutrition data on myself that i can use because they don't test people like me they only test sick population it's it's mental all right so i just want you to understand that at some point you might come up against this and have a decision to make, okay? What else we got? Catherine, I feel 100% better during a fast when compared to when I eat. Fasting wasn't my new favorite, but a lot of people say that. That means that you're probably dealing with some more, um, you know, there's some metabolic dysfunction that still needs to be undone. And don't take that as a bad thing because these things, you know, they take time. It can take years to, to fix all the metabolic dysfunction, right? So you feel good fasting, fast, you know, no problem. Andrea, I've been more active during my fast than I've been for months. I just feel so much more clear. That's a huge one is the cognition, the cognitive effects. That's what people tend to notice more than anything. It's like by day two, they're like, oh my God, I feel like I took the limitless drug, you know? It's crazy. What else we got? Uh, thank you. I've been tagged with familial hypercholesterolemia. Yeah, I, I really don't, don't buy that much anymore. I'm telling you. I just think that... Uh, they, people throw that diagnosis around because they really don't know what else to do. Like I said, I was told that I was that, and I just don't think that that's, that's accurate. Um, most of the time, I think, it's, I think FH is a real thing, um, but it's, I think it's very rare. I think it's much rarer than people think it is. Um, Danielle, my dad died of a heart attack at 56. It was not heavy, but I'm sure he had inflammation. But I'm trying to fix it myself. Yeah, if you want to fix inflammation, there is nothing better than Clovis. You could literally look at any other program on planet Earth, and I would put my program up against it, and I would be willing to bet blood work, like for real. Uh, if you tried six months of Clovis, strict Clovis, and we measured your inflammation levels, and then you tried six months of some other diet and measured your inflammation levels, I would, I'd would i probably bet my company on the fact that your inflammation levels would be lower with Clovis. It is the single best anti-inflammation protocol I have ever seen in all of my research, and that's because all of my research is what created Clovis. So uh, trust me, I promise you, your inflammation levels are going to go in the right direction. Like I said, mine literally don't even measure. I'm below reference range for systemic inflammation. It's crazy. I have no inflammation in my body, which is why like, people ask me about my skin a lot, actually. I get a lot of questions about my skin, right? 
So inflammation like is behind all issues like leaky gut leads to inflammation. Inflammation lead, can manifest itself as skin issues, acne, all these things, right? Like I don't use clear sill or some special shit I put on my face. Or I don't put oil on my face. I don't put lotion on my face. I don't do anything. I get under the water and I use Dr. Bronner soap on my whole body, even my shampoo. I don't use shampoo. I don't use conditioner. I don't use any kind of skin stuff, nothing. I just always look like this. My skin's always clear and I look younger than I am because I don't have systemic inflammation. That's all there is to it, you know? Nice and easy. What else we got? Happened to my husband, new doctor. Wow, you look great and so healthy. All blood work great besides that and tried to put on statins. Yes, 100%. This is crazy. Actually, myopic. Like, I want to just slap. I want to just open hand slap. But you can't do that. That's against the law. Don't slap anybody. But um, yeah, it's insane. You'll walk in and literally be like every single measure of my... That's the other thing. The guy that came to me freaking out. His total cholesterol was a little high. His LDLP was a little high. His HDL was off the charts good. Triglycerides, off the charts good. Fasted insulin, fantastic. Fasted glucose, fantastic. Everything was great. Everything was great. Doctor wants to put him on a statin. Those are two numbers. Because the doctor doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Right? Ridiculous. But anyway, uh, let me know if you guys have anything last minute here. It's 9, 10, so we're going to wrap this one up. This has been AMA number 80. Covered a lot of ground tonight. Man, I'm, I'm loving these little AMAs where I just kind of sit and chat with you. I love the whiteboard, too. Um, you guys let me know. Let me know what you like more. So uh, obviously, click the like button. Click the happy button now. Click the heart button. Click all the engagement stuff. Share this with your people. Remember, this is a public video, so you can tag people. You can wait until I'm talking about cholesterol, and you can tag your friend who refuses to eat fat because he thinks it's going to give them heart disease, right? You can tag your friends and let them know what they need to hear, right? So tag your friends, click the happy button, click the like button, click the share button, share this in your timeline. When the podcast comes out, share the podcast, share, share, share. The more sharing, the better. The more people we bring into Clovis, the more we can literally change the world. I'm not kidding, guys, I'm trying to change the world. I don't do this for my own health. Clovis is terrible for my health, I promise you, right? <laughs> I sit at this computer all damn day, right? It's quite bad for my health, but I love it. And I wanna spread this information. I wanna help you spread the information with your loved ones as well. So please share this. Thank you for all the questions. Remember, you can always go to ama.iamclovis.com. You can leave me questions at any time. I can answer them on the next AMA. I keep a stockpile of these questions so I can just go through them and uh, have good episodes for you guys, have content. Hope you guys like it. If you want to see more whiteboard stuff, let me know. Um, join the Facebook groups, facebook.com slash groups slash Clovis Academy. Go to the Clovis Academy and join. Let me know. Be like, hey, man, you've been sitting at that table a couple weeks. I want to see a whiteboard on such and such, or I want you to cover such and such topic, right? Like, always do that. I'm always working behind the scenes. I got new programs that are about to launch. I have new products in the in the, in the works, new supplements. Can anybody say electrolytes, mm, right? So I have new things I'm working on behind the scenes, which is fantastic. So stick around, continue to be a member of I Am Clovis. You're gonna get first dibs on all these new things that come out. Um, totally worth it. So go to IamClovis.com slash start if you wanna work with me. IamClovis.com slash start. I highly recommend, hint, hint, wink, wink, hint, hint, wink, wink. If you need a custom nutrition plan, get it right now. The entire system is changing, I promise you. I've been working behind the scenes on this for months. The entire system, the entire platform of how you get a custom nutrition plan from me is about to change. If you don't have a custom nutrition plan, get one now because you're gonna come to me and you're gonna not be happy a little bit down the line when you see that there is going to be a new price for a custom nutrition plan. So fair warning, if you don't have a custom nutrition plan, go get one right now or you're gonna be upset with yourself that you didn't. So go to iamclovis.com slash start. Lots of changes in the works. Mama just walked in. Ah, cool. All right. That means it's time to wrap up. 9, 12 p.m. Thank you guys so much for being here. AMA number 80. I hope you liked it. Share, share, share. Love, love, love. I love you guys. Thanks for being here. Have a great night. Turn off the screens. Get some good quality sleep. I'll see you tomorrow in the groups. All right. Bye-bye.